Good afternoon, everybody. My name is State Representative Claire Cronin. I represent parts of the town of Easton and the city of Brockton. And I am so excited to have you here today uh, to view this virtual forum on prostate cancer awareness uh, in the era of the COVID-19 pandemic. So today this forum is held in uh, support and honor of our first responders who have been on the front line of this pandemic since the beginning. They are saving lives and they are continuing throughout this pandemic to provide necessary assistance to the countless members of our community. COVID-19 and prostate cancer have both emerged as leading health disparities in both the African American and our Latino communities. Brockton and many of our surrounding towns have been hot spots in the COVID-19 pandemic. And the goal today is to empower everyone in our communities of how they can protect their families and protect their communities by reducing the spread of COVID and by taking care of their prostate health. So with that, I am going to introduce my co-host for today, uh, my colleague and very dear friend, uh, Representative Jerry Cassidy. And Representative Cassidy has been the leading champion uh, for reducing health disparities with regard to COVID-19 and prostate cancer. Every year, Representative Cassidy files the amendment that supports our programs that support prostate cancer uh, awareness and all things that uh, are concerned with the disparities that exist in our communities as a result. So with that, I, Jerry. Thank, thank you, uh, Madam. Turn. You're thank up. you, Madam Leader. So uh, Speaker Mariano is probably one of the nicest people I've known him for uh, 30, 35 years. And the best thing he ever did was just uh, uh, point Claire to be the uh, majority leader. So thank you, uh, Speaker Mariano, for doing a doing, uh, uh, great, great job by appointing you. Um, uh, Claire was just saying that I've been the lead sponsor for the last five years. And uh, it's an honor because the Brockton uh, NAACP has uh, been from this. And uh, each and every year, it's just a uh, hot wrench in that uh, how many people have passed away uh, from the prostate cancer. But this past year has been very, very difficult. Here in Brockton, uh, with the uh, COVID, um, we lost 415 people this uh, this past year, as the mayor, mayor knows. It, it's just been a very difficult, uh, difficult year. You know, I remember when Jack Units, when he was mayor, the first, uh, first week or two, he had a snowstorm after snowstorm. Mayor Sullivan has uh, this, this pandemic and Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for uh, doing everything you're doing here in Brockton. Um, the uh, funding issue is a huge thing for that uh, that uh, uh, Madam Leader and I have been working on for the last five years. And uh, now that the COVID is somewhat getting towards the end, don't be afraid to go into uh, your doctor's office um, and get your uh, prostate uh, checked. Uh, we have a wonderful uh, uh, group here of rent honorees. We have Brockton Police Chief Manny Gomes, uh, Fire Chief Mike Williams, and uh, Krista uh, Devona from uh, Director of Clinical Quality from uh, Brewster Ambulance. Uh, thank you all for being here. And I invite uh, Manny Gomes, the Chief Gomes, to uh, uh, say a few words, please. Hi, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for the invite. Um, uh, you know, th this is, th these have been crazy times. Everybody, everybody knows that. Not only has COVID been difficult for the city of Brockton, it's also been a moving target. We, we have to keep readjusting uh, almost on a daily basis. The police department uh, has been affected by it. As you can all understand that uh, our calls for service have remained. They have not dropped off because of COVID. They actually have gone up. So the police department handling more calls. We have to work very hard to not only keep our staff healthy, uh, because without them, uh, if you know, we are a centralized building, if, if we were to get it infected and have a lot of officers get infected, uh, we wouldn't be able to provide the uh, full service that we do. 
and uh, it would cause a, a greater crisis for the city. I, I want you to know that our officers have taken this really serious. I want you to know that Brockton police cruisers have been out uh, for nearly a year now, giving out uh, PPE to people on the street, everything from masks to hand sanitizers. We've even stepped up our efforts with the homeless and the opioid uh, addicted people who we have uh, trying to get them housing, trying to get them off the street, trying to get them some treatment. Because um, we found that there were uh, higher rates of uh, COVID uh, amongst those groups. We even have officers that uh, their full-time job is to follow up on these matters, not just the uniformed officers. Um, and, and I understand we're talking about two subjects here today. And I, I can only tell you uh, when you get into the, the, the prostate issue, as a man in his 50s, I got to tell you, you got to take things really serious. And, and I speak as a man because we are the most reluctant to go to doctors. Uh, you know, a guy will cut his finger and put electrical tape on it, not do anything about it. <laughs> and we, we have to get past that. It, it's a guy thing. And uh, I want you to know that I push it on my officers uh, as the department gets a little older. But you know, I, even throughout this pandemic, I go, I go to examinations. Sometimes I lie a little bit, but uh, I still, I still go every year, and I try to, uh, I try to follow that up. Uh, and I've also been affected by this because I have not one but two friends uh, that were affected uh, by prostate cancer, and uh, one of them uh, was smart enough and get, it was caught very early because he was proactive in early testing. And I had another one that went on to have some severe bladder uh, cancer that required surgery, was life-threatening. He's still going through treatments, and it was because of the other end that he didn't uh, take it serious. So uh, thank you for bringing this to the forefront, and, uh, and thank you for the invite. Thanks so much, Chief. Uh, and we're very happy to honor you here today. So we appreciate your coming on board and sharing uh, those words. So with that, I'm also going to introduce uh, one of our other honorees, and that would be my friend, uh, our fire chief, uh, Chief Mike Williams, who will, will be honored today as well. And Chief, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to tell us a little about your experiences and the experiences of the Brockton Fire Department uh, in the COVID-19 era. Well, thank you, Representative Cronin. I appreciate those kind words and thank you to everyone for having me today. Um, yeah, dur during this past year, we we've all been going through very trying times. Um, COVID has obviously hit the city of Brockton very hard. Um, and also as, as my department and, and as Chief Gomes mentioned, um, we're out on the front lines. Um, trying to protect not only the citizens of Brockton, but also ourselves and uh, our firefighters, uh, keeping them safe and protected. Um, but as today's topic is speaking about uh, prostate cancer, um, I would just urge everyone, as I've urged my own department, um, because of COVID, a lot of people have neglected, let's say, their annual checkups or visits to the doctor. Um, <clears throat> now that things have started to decline, I think it's very important that everyone realize that it's, it's time to go back to your doctor. Um, get, get, get checked for not only prostate cancer, but, but any, anything that might affect your health, because that's the most important thing in life, is your health. Uh, it's not only important to you, but also your families and your loved ones. Um, so I urge all of my, my people um, to get checked annually. Obviously, Cancer in the fire service has skyrocketed um, because of some of the dangers that we face. Cancer affects firefighters sometimes a lot earlier on than the average person, let's say. Um, most people really start to um, get their annual checkups and things when they hit 50. Um, we as firefighters, we, we, we urge people to start that process when they hit 40. Um, just to, to catch things in the beginning, as Chief Gomes says, um, to catch things early is extremely important. And I, I urge all of my people to, to stay, stay vigilant on, on your health and in your, um, you know, warning signs that, that may come about. And, and, and it's really important to, to, to stay on top of those things. So, again, I want to thank you for having me today. And I uh, enjoy being here. Thank, thank you, Chief Williams. Now we have the, another honoree, 
we have Chris Bona from uh, the Brewster, Am Brewster Ambulance. Uh, if you could just talk a little about the uh, pandemic in your program here. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, Mr. Cassidy and uh, Representative Cronin. Thank you for having us. Um, uh, you know, for us as well, uh, to, to echo both chiefs, uh, a challenging year. Uh, each day has been a different set of rules. Um, and it's been amazing to watch the EMTs and the paramedics, uh, you know, kind of change their posture on how to deal with this. I also have to echo, uh, you know, what Chief Williams said is, um, you know, things have been put on hold because of COVID. And with the increase of telehealth over this last year, there's a lot of opportunities for folks to just check in, but you're really missing that human touch point. Um, you know, of values, of uh, exams, of imaging, uh, as well as blood work and things like that. Everybody can look well and do well over the phone, but those touch points are, are dramatically missing. So, um, you know, folks have to go back to um, their physician groups uh, to get these studies and get those normal routines. Um, and this is happening with everything, right? It's not just uh, the prostate exams. This is cardiac, it's diabetes, it's uh, different types of cancers. Um, it could be skin. Um, so these need to be exercised more and more. Um, 2020 and, and early 2021 for us, um, I think the biggest thing we noticed was a huge psychosocial impact with this. Um, not only getting COVID and what, you know, what are my neighbors going to think? What are my coworkers going to think? Um, and that, that spills over to a financial impact. Um, folks are working multiple jobs uh, to make ends meet. And with that comes less time, um, you know, to get these exams. Tremendously important, um, and to, to echo Chief Gomes, it's definitely a guy thing. Um, guys put things off uh, because they just say everything's all cherries, but um, it'll sneak up on you really quick. And those those early appointments, um, you know, need to come down from the 50s, like Chief, Chief Williams said, and into the early 40s. Um, this is impacting uh, younger populations, not only not only men but women as well. Um, and it's 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 uh, uh, very concerning with these increased cancers. Terrific. Thanks so much, Chris, and uh, thanks for all you've done throughout this time. So now it is my honor to introduce a woman who needs no introduction. Uh, when you need to get things done, you call Phyllis. So it is my uh, honor to introduce uh, my good friend and the president of the Brockton area branch of the NAACP, the indomitable Phyllis Ellis. Claire, thank you, such kind words. And Good sure. afternoon, everyone. <laughs> we have very distinguished guests here today, and I would like to thank and welcome Mayor Sullivan, Chief Gomes, Chief Williams, Chief Officer DeBona, our Master of Ceremonies, House Majority Leader, Clara Cronin, and Representative Cassidy, who have been outstanding advocates over the years and our guest panelist, Dr. Zalds, who is always available to come and talk about prostate cancer. And Dr. Herman, who is always very cooperative and Representative Santiago. We are always, always appreciative of Dr. Stern as a panelist. So thank you all for being here. The Brockton area branch has been partners with Admitech Foundation and Good Samaritan Hospital for over six years. We could not ask for better partners from, than Dr. Stern and Lynn Cornelius, sorry. I believe together we have made a difference by hosting the prostate cancer awareness events. When we first partnered, Brockton had the highest rate of mortality for prostate cancer among African-American men. We are no longer at the highest. That tells me that men, namely African-American men, are paying attention and going to get tested. It is not easy to get men to go to the doctor, so a little nudge from a loved one is always good. But we do have success stories. After attending one of our events, this gentleman decided to go get tested. He was glad he did. He was diagnosed with prostate cancer. He is doing well now. So being informed really, really helps. Prostate cancer is a killer. Early detection could save your life. Admitech, Good Samaritan, and Brockton Area Branch will continue to host prostate awareness events. I look forward to continuing this partnership. If we can save one life, our work is being done. So today we will address your questions and concerns with respect to what is the status of the COVID-19 pandemic in Brockton and related community resources? What can you do today to protect yourself and your family? 
How do you take charge of your prostate health in the face of the pandemic? What are the cutting edge advances in prostate cancer care? Now we host these events about three times a year, but it takes a lot of preparation. So I would like to take this time to thank Dr. Stern and Thomas from Admi Tech Foundation, Lynn Cornelius from Good Samaritan, the Brockton Area Branch Health Committee, Janet Trass as chair, Steve Bernard, who brought Chief Gomes and Chief Williams here today, Leona Martin, and a new member, Mark Lindy, who brought Chief Officer Devona. We have a great team and we work very, very well together. So let's keep up the good work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Phyllis. That was absolutely wonderful. As always, you are, you are a true champion here in the city of Brockton. Speaking of another uh, champion, we have uh, uh, next is I'd like to introduce Mayor Sullivan. Uh, what you and uh, Dr. Herman, I tell you, you've gone through one heck of a year, and I just want to uh, thank you for coming on. And uh, over to you, Mayor Sullivan. Thank you very much, uh, Representative Cassie and Lita Cronin. Thank you for your uh, public service in, in in the city and 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 Lita Cronin's case throughout the district. Um, we're all in this together and collaboration is key. And I want to take a moment to thank the uh, NAACP led by President Ellis and all the members uh, and also Steve Bernard, who brought this to my attention many years ago uh, as a city councilor at large when we filed the resolve and Steve came in. Uh, I want to thank all the doctors, all the medical clinicians and the chiefs. Uh, you know, COVID has ravaged our community uh, physically, financially, emotionally. Uh, all encompassing, um, and you know, over over twelve thousand, uh, almost twelve thousand four hundred cases in the city of Brockton. And as Rep. Cassidy said, we've lost four hundred and fifteen residents to this deadly virus. Uh, but in terms of prostate can uh, cancer awareness, um, you know, as I shared on the last uh, symposium, my own father is a is a prostate cancer survivor, and uh, you know, Dr. Zalls is 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 an angel in my family for for really uh, saving my dad's life. So. We all know uh, many fine people that have perished because of this deadly virus. Uh, you know, 50 seems to be the age, but I know people in their 40s that have come down with this virus and early detection is, is, is paramount for uh, healthy recovery. So uh, I just wanna thank everybody for taking their time out of a Sunday uh, to, to educate and inform. And again, as, as, as Steve has shared and as President Ellis has shared, statistically our African-American men are getting uh, this deadly virus a higher rate than, than white uh, uh, residents of the city as well. So if we can continue to be vigilant and diligent, we'll save lives. And uh, again, I just wanna thank everybody for, for joining today. And I'm really excited to listen and learn to uh, the medical clinicians. Thank you, leader, and thank you, representative. Thanks. Th thank you. And I, I think uh, the, Dr. Herman, if you could uh, say a couple words, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you for your leadership. Well, thanks. It's uh, it's thank you very much for inviting me. I feel very honored to be among such a distinguished uh, crowd. I'm going to share my screen and um, give everyone an update on uh, where COVID has been over the past year and bring you right up to speed with numbers that have uh, been updated as of about 30 minutes ago. So you'll get the uh, most up to date numbers. Uh, here we go. This is pandemic day 373. Over a year ago, we had our first case on March 14th of, uh, of 2020. And during that first wave in the spring, this is what the heat map of the city of Brockton looked like. This corridor right down the center of the city is where most of the cases were, as well as a few hot spots where the nursing homes were. And interestingly enough, that corridor down the center of the city correlated with so many areas of vulnerability that we have in the city. Um, that This is a, a map put together by our friends at the um, Academic Public Health Volunteer Corps. You can see right down the center of the city, uh, all areas of vulnerability with disability, elderly, uh, no internet access, no English speaking, and uh, that correlates with the amount of COVID that we've seen as well. Uh, and Brockton is a, a setup for COVID uh, just because it has so many socioeconomic aspects that lend itself to COVID, especially uh, being number one in the Commonwealth in terms of the share of frontline workers, which as you know, uh, puts people at risk for uh, getting the disease. This is what COVID has looked like uh, over the past 365 plus days. Uh, big surge last spring, and then we saw a quiet summer, and then Thanksgiving surge, Christmas surge, and then things have quieted down. But 
I just want to stress very much that although things have quieted down, they have not continued to fall. They've plateaued at about 20 cases a day. And, and this is by no means a disease that is gone. It is still prevalent in the community. And there are many in the public health world who do not feel this is a time to really be <laughs> celebrating and opening things up. This is a time where we still have to maintain vigilance because 20 cases a day is, is still quite a bit. It's where we were back in, in October. So something to keep an eye out. And if you take a closer look. This is just from the beginning of January until uh, yesterday. You can see how the cases have really plateaued over the, over the past several weeks. Uh, and, and just to be aware that uh, uh, there's still plenty of cases that are out there. This is what tonight's dashboard is going to look like. And we, for those of you who don't know, we post a dashboard on the city website uh, every day. And this is as of about an hour ago, 12,414 cases uh, in the city of which 215 are still in isolation. Uh, we have plenty of people still in the hospital and in the ICU. And we've added a, a metric to look at the amount of folks in Brockton, the city of Brockton, who have been vaccinated. Uh, and every weekend, I also like to post our neighbors what the, the surrounding communities are doing. And you can see that most of us have fallen from the red into the, into the yellow, which is a good thing, but not, as I said, still not a time, not a time to celebrate yet. This is uh, what our red, yellow, green number has done over the past several months since the beginning of the year. And over the past three weeks, we've hit into the yellow and continued to fall. But my concern is that come this Thursday, we're not going to be falling anymore. We're going to be going up a bit. Uh, and I know we're several days away from this Thursday when that number is going to be released. But I feel very confident that the number is going to continue is going to go back up a bit. And for this reason, I think we all have to maintain our vigilance and watch out for certain things. And the things we've got to watch out for are number of people in the hospital. So this is what the hospitalization numbers have looked like um, since uh, Christmas time. And as you can see, they continue to fall, but again, have plateaued. And I put these, this is between the two hospitals, and I put this number 50 cases, which represents 15% of the hospital beds in the city of Brockton. And the CDC says anything over 15 is really in their red zone uh, and high risk, uh, high prevalence of COVID. And anything less than 5% is their green zone. And although we looked like we were heading in that direction, we really have leveled off. So there's still plenty of COVID in the hospitals. And of course, this is what we're trying to prevent is hospitalizations and deaths. And as we look at the deaths in the city of Brockton, they too have not gone away. Uh, every week, each, and each blue bar is a week. Uh, and this is the past several weeks. We're still hovering between uh, five and 10 deaths per week uh, in the city. So again, we would have liked it to drop and drop and drop, but it has not done that. And so uh, where are the cases coming from? Well, every Thursday we talk with the Community Tracing Collaborative and they break down all the cases for us. I'm not gonna go over this bar just to kind of give everyone an idea that we, we look at household spreads and clusters and close contacts and where in the workplace things have been spreading. And we also break it down by sectors to see what areas uh, of the community uh, uh, COVID is spreading in and, you know, for the, for example, the food service and all its related fields, restaurants, bakeries, food processing, grocery stores seems to be uh, quite prevalent. But this is just so that the, the Board of Health and others can kind of focus their contact tracing and educational efforts. And as you know, the city has been very active uh, in uh, distributing vaccines through both the Brockton Neighborhood Health Center in partnership with the Board of Health and the city uh, mayor's office, who uh, has been collaborating and using the Shaw Center to give out the vaccines. But, and here's the but, as the uh, virus continues to spread, I, I, I believe we are at a very crucial point right now where things can either go up or they can go down. And they can go up because these variants and vaccine and virus variants have started to make their way into Massachusetts. And they spread more rapidly and may cause more serious illness. And if the variants win the race, then the numbers are gonna go up. 
On the other hand, if folks continue to get vaccinated and maintain their vigilance, social distancing, crowds, no indoors, uh, hand washing, mask wearing, then the numbers can level off or go down. So this is the, the, the precarious situation that we find ourselves in right now. And I just want to echo the theme of Chris and Manny, uh, uh, Chief Gomes and Chris DeBona about men. Not only do they not go to get their prostate checked and their blood pressure checked and their diabetes checked, but they don't go and get COVID shots. And this is what Brockton looks like right now. So fully vaccinated folks in Brockton, nearly two to one women to men. And so I know we were talking about healthcare disparities and there's a lot of focus on equity and identifying groups who uh, need to be targeted to get the vaccine. And we'll go over that in just a little bit. But the biggest group I think that we do need to target to get out there and get vaccinated is guys. We are not getting shot. And uh, the same is true for even for those who are partially vaccinated. Uh, 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 women just far more uh, doses of vaccine than men. So uh, who are the targeted communities in Brockton that we wanna look at? Well, we got a sneak peek early in the pandemic when Brockton Neighborhood Health Center offered all of its employees, regardless of age, the chance to get the vaccine. Why? Because they're frontline workers and they were eligible. And of all of their workers, 70% uh, of the white workers got vaccinated, only 24% of the black. And, to, and you can see the rest in terms of race. When we looked at ethnicity, only 13% of Haitian employees took the vaccine, 28% of Cape Verdean employees. This gives us an idea of certain communities where there is a huge amount of vaccine resistance, reluctance to get uh, vaccinated, where we need to do some more work and target our efforts. Here in Brockton, this is a breakdown of the city. Uh, the uh, Department of Public Health feels that we have 50% black residents, 30% white residents, et cetera, et cetera. So when we're giving out the vaccine, you would expect that because the 50% of the residents are black, that 50% would get the vaccine. Yet if we look at the first dose of who's gotten the vaccine in the city, you can see that although 50% black residents, only 33% of the people that have gotten the vaccine are black, compared to white residents, where 30% are white, yet 41% of those got a first dose. The same with those who are fully vaccinated. Again, because 50% uh, black, you would expect to see 50% to be fully vaccinated, yet it's less than that. Clearly, there is a hesitancy uh, in the black residents to get vaccinated. Now, it's not all bad news when we look at uh, break it down by age and who has been vaccinated, we can see that because we have targeted older residents and they were in the first priority group, 67% of those age 75 and older have already gotten at least one dose and 55% in the older than 65, 65 to 75 age group have gotten at least one dose. This is a good thing because these are folks clearly at high risk of hospitalization and death. And so hopefully if these numbers continue to go up, then those hospitalization numbers that I showed you just a bit ago and uh, death toll numbers hopefully will start to plummet and uh, go down. So for those who think it's time to go out and mingle and uh, let their guard down, this is the graph I wanna show you. There have been 12,400 cases in the city of Brockton. Uh, 8845 uh, have been fully vaccinated. These are the ones who are unprotected. Uh, and so if you think that uh, we're on our way to victory, uh, I would just ask you to take another look at this, even if you add a whole bunch of unknown folks who have never been tested, who probably did have COVID, uh, there's still plenty of folks out there who are vulnerable to get uh, COVID, who are, uh, unless they uh, you know, continue to practice mask wearing and social distancing are still uh, at risk. So uh, that's my take on where we stand right now in the uh, in the city and I would encourage uh, as uh, uh, Chief Gomes and uh, uh, Chris Debona said, um, men uh, really need to step up to the plate and take charge of their health and also get vaccinated. Thanks, Dr. Herman. And thank you for all you have done uh, 
you and the mayor together have really done an amazing job. And the data you put forth today is, uh, I'm really gonna have to analyze it because there's some really interesting things that were coming out of that. And I think we do have to pay close attention. So thanks for all your work on that, much appreciated. Uh, and now I am going to introduce uh, another doctor, uh, my friend and house colleague, Dr. John Santiago. Uh, Dr. Santiago, Rep Santiago, or John, San, just John, has really, uh, can I say created a splash when he came to the State House? Uh, he very, very quickly emerged as one of, uh, you know, within his class, extremely talented, extremely smart. Uh, he is a state rep, so he is, you know, up on all the policy ends of things, but also John has been working as an emergency room doctor at Boston Medical Center. Uh, right now, um, with mixed emotions, I say, uh, John is a candidate for mayor of Boston. We, we already lost one of our house members with Mayor Marty Walsh and as much as I love having John as a member of the house, I'm so proud to support him in his quest for being mayor as well. Uh, so with that, I wanna introduce our good friend, John Santiago. Uh, well, well, thank you so much for your kind of words, Madam Leader. It's, uh, it's been an honor to serve with you and uh, Representative um, Cassidy for the past uh, several years in the House of Representatives. I've learned so much there um, from interacting with folks, staff, legislative leaders, people like yourself, who I'm happy to call mentors, and people like Dr. Stern, who I know when Dr. Stern shows up to your office, um, you better be there, you better listen, and you better bring your notebook because she comes engaged and has really been a partner, not just with respect to prostate cancer and the disparities that exist, but about healthcare and uh, even in the age of COVID-19. I mean, this is my third event, I think, with Dr. Stern with respect to COVID, prostate cancer, and I think second of which has been in Brockton partnering with NLACP. You know, we were fortunate to make a call, I wanna say, I don't know, we, we've been in this fight for about a year now, uh, maybe eight or nine months ago when we had our first talk with folks in Brockton as a guest of Representative Cassidy and in honor to share my experiences, not just as a state representative, but as an ER provider on the front lines and, and my experiences in that, uh, with that. Um, so secondly, congratulations to all the honorees on the phone, uh, on, the, on the virtual phone call right now. Um, your work as essential workers has been um, absolutely essential to the fight against COVID-19. Um, now, I work in the emergency room, obviously, as a physician, but each shift I work, I interact with firemen, cops, uh, you know, folks from uh, the me uh, medical uh, health professionals. And so it's important that we understand this is a team game, and that the only way we're going to get out of this is together. And I'm hopeful that um, in, the, in the course of the next couple of months, we will be out of this thing. But as Dr. Uh, Dr. Herman said, um, I couldn't agree with this presentation more, honestly. You know, I feel like he took the words right out of my mouth in terms of his description of the disease, of where we're at in the state of affairs, not just in Brockton, but across the whole Commonwealth, particularly with respect to the way he described things in terms of the variants versus the vaccines. He is absolutely correct. We are in a race against these variants. As some of you may know, there are three variants that have been found um, in the United States, um, the Brazilian, the British, and the, um, uh, the South African. And these are proven to be significantly more transmissible, potentially more resistant um, to the vaccine. So that's why it's even more important that we get vaccinated as soon as possible. And my experience on the front line would suggest to me that we have a lot of work to do. Um, when the first surge happened, you know, as someone, as many, as many people on this phone call like to do, they like to jump in there in the fire. And I'd actually doubled my hours in the emergency department during the first surge. I'm working every week that first surge and the challenges were real. As a scientist and as a physician, we quite literally had no idea um, what we were doing at, at, at the outset and how things have changed, which is really a testament to science and to medicine, right? And so I remember going to the emergency room before it was um, declared this uh, you know, global pandemic and working with the nurses literally every shift of coming up with a game plan of what we would put people. And if you can recall, we were told to intubate early, you know, to give things like hydroxychloroquine and to not give things like steroids. And think about where we've progressed now. 
we're doing the exact opposite. And as a result, I think we've done a lot better job of taking care of folks uh, you know, with COVID-19. You know, my experiences in the hospital have suggested to me that we are on a path to improving things across the Commonwealth. Infections have gone down, hospitalizations have gone down. We as a medical staff feel much more comfortable taking care of people with COVID-19, but we have a lot more to do. You know, obviously this past year has been tragic. We've lost about 16,000 people. And again, we're in this race against the variants. So where we are in terms of the state of affairs, we are in the midst of this vaccination rollout. We have to get to 4 million people, according to Governor Baker. I think I heard on an interview that he would like to get to four and a half, five, which are really important goals to get. And there's no doubt that the vaccination rollout began quite bumpy. Uh, but here we are today, we're top 10 in the country in terms of shots per capita and the percentage of shots that were given and administered to people, which is, which is great. Um, and I gotta give a lot of credit to Governor Baker and his staff for moving forward. And a lot of credit to the legislature has really pushed for more culturally competent, linguistically appropriate and comprehensive strategy in terms of addressing the vaccination issue. But there's still so much work to do. I think as Dr. Herman suggested to you on the slides, that those disparities that you're seeing in Brockton exist all across the Commonwealth. They exist where I live in Boston and in my neighborhood here, um, to the point where if you're black or brown, you're three times more likely to be infected, twice as more likely to die. And in terms of the vaccination, I think the graph, uh, the chart that Dr. Herman showed is exactly right. Even if you're black or brown, more likely to be infected or die, you still have less access to the vaccination. So it's a point that we still continue to invest in institutions and organizations that are committed to vaccine equity. That's something I've been fighting for as, a, as the vice chair of the COVID-19 um, committee. That's something I know that Representative Pronin and Cassie care very much about. To the fact that just this past week in my neighborhood alone, we partnered with a community health center, uh, a MassCon medical, even Brewster, and I see Brewster's on the phone call today, to vaccinate 300 people, some of the most difficult housing situations, some of the Boston Housing Authority. And that's what we're gonna need, this type of innovative strategy to go get those hardest to reach people. Um, and, uh, and that's what I, I anticipate what Dr. Herman and the folks at Brockton will be doing and have been doing for a long time. So just to give you a heads up where we're at in the vaccination rollout plan, on the 22nd of March tomorrow, if you're over 60 and if you're an essential worker, looks like you'll be el eligible. Come April 5th, that 60 drops down to 55 and people with one comorbidity can get vaccinated as well. And at the 19th, the plan is, let's cross our fingers, fingers that the general public will be able to get vaccinated. So long story short, we are in a race against these variants. We have to get vaccinated because if we know anything about COVID-19 is that it continues to throw us curveballs. And that has really taken the lid off these inequities, has exposed them and has exacerbated them. And we see it in the data, you know, we see it in our education system, in our healthcare system, and it makes us uh, makes it no surprise why the prostate cancers uh, uh, disparities in care exist. And so I'm honored to be here um, to work in partnership with my state house colleagues and my municipal colleagues and folks like Dr. Shern to really pass off this pass, pass on this message of um, making sure health cares are right and that we're just addressing equity as soon and as fast as possible. So thank you so much for the invitation. Thank thank you, Representative Vice Chairman and uh, hopefully uh, Mayor. Uh, I appreciate uh, you coming out and. Uh, I know it's a busy season, but you're definitely right about uh, Dr. Stern. Um, that's the one thing I miss about being at, at the state house. She comes knocking on your door, and you 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 better be there. Is correct. She uh, she's a true uh, true fighter and champion. Uh, you know, being president of uh, Admitech, and uh, I I miss seeing you in person, Dr. Stern. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce everybody to the famous Dr. Stern. Thank you. Thank you so much for all the kind words. Uh, to everyone, to um, and uh, obviously it is our honor and a privilege to lead the battle against COVID-19 and against prostate cancer disparities. We actually pre-recorded pre a video and I would ask uh, Ali to um, put this video on. Uh, my presentation will focus on transition from COVID-19 advances to prostate cancer um, cutting edge prostate cancer diagnostics. And my presentation will be followed by that of Dr. Uh, Jason Zuls, who will talk about advances, recent advances in prostate cancer treatment. I would like to thank Admitec Foundation partners in organizing this event, Brockton NAACP and Good Samaritan Medical Center. It is important for us to honor first responders who are leading the battle 
against the COVID-19 pandemic. Firefighters, police, and emergency medical technicians. This event is an integral part of the statewide program in prostate cancer research, medical education, and public awareness, creating a Massachusetts model of national and global leadership. The priority focus of our program is on high-risk men, particularly African-American and Hispanic individuals, their caregivers, and physicians. This program is led by Admitech Foundation in cooperation with members of the Prostate Cancer Action Council, including statewide organizations such as American Cancer Society, New England Area Conference, NACP and its branches, Latino Health Insurance Program, multiple local community partners, and independent expert panel consisting of leaders in clinical care and research. Our program has three components, public awareness, medical education, and research. Our public awareness efforts are focused on the most vulnerable and underserved communities. Early in 2020, we have realized that the areas of health disparities in prostate cancer overlap these hotspots of the COVID pandemic. Consequently, we expanded our education to include COVID prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. Together with members of the Prostate Cancer Action Council, we reached over 16,000 underprivileged individuals since January last year. Since 2015, we chose Brockton and Plymouth County as our priority due to the highest level of prostate cancer mortality and related health disparities in African-American men in Massachusetts. In Brockton, we built an ongoing program of community education that until today serves as a model for other parts of our state. The key elements of our program include ongoing partnership of Admitech Foundation, Brockton NAACP and Good Samaritan Medical Center, broad community engagement, including mayor's office, city council, churches, other organizations, and local media, including Brockton Community Access TV, Brockton Enterprise, with their considerable outreach. Training of local community leaders and providing high impact educational materials that were distributed at multiple local events in Plymouth County. Ongoing educational workshops and individual counseling. By late 2019, we started seeing decreased mortality for all men in Plymouth County and reduced disparities in African-American men compared to state average. Since January 2020, over 4,000 people were reached in Brockton. Early in the pandemic, Brockton emerged as one of the hotspots, and it was here in Brockton since May 2020, when for the first time, we expanded our program in prostate cancer awareness to include COVID-19, an immediate threat to lives and health. We focused on what we as individuals can do to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities and end this pandemic. Social distancing, avoiding large gatherings, protecting our faces, hands, and eyes, choosing outdoor instead of indoor activities, getting vaccinated when our turn comes. In particular, we addressed hesitancy related to masks and vaccines. The best recent predictions indicate that universal masks alone can save over 70,000 American lives and prevent infections in millions of people by early July this year. COVID diagnostics are critical for early detection, control of pandemic, and safe return to work and schools. Over the last year, we have seen exciting advances in COVID treatment. It is critical to diagnose COVID early when several treatment strategies have been promising in eliminating virus, preventing progression to severe disease, and expediting recovery. The ultimate goal in ending this pandemic is to have publicly available vaccines. Current evidence indicates that Pfizer, Moderna, Johnson & Johnson vaccines are safe and highly effective at preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death. Several other vaccines, such as Novavax, 
show considerable promise and may become available soon. On March 2nd, President Biden announced there will be sufficient doses for all adult Americans by May this year. On March 11, in his first address to the nation, President Biden directed states to make vaccines available to all by May 2nd. On March 17, Governor Baker announced that vaccines will become available to all in Massachusetts even earlier by April 19. We are in a race between vaccines and viral variants. President Biden cautioned that situation may get worse again as new variants spread. And if we do not stay vigilant, restrictions may have to be reinstated to get back on track. However, he also pointed out, if we do our part, if we do this together, by July 4th, there is a good chance you, your family and friends will be able to get together in a small group to celebrate Independence Day. Several months ago, President Biden joined former Presidents Obama, Bush, and Clinton in volunteering to be publicly vaccinated and reassure everyone that FDA-approved vaccines are safe. While we are dealing with COVID pandemic, Pastor cancer cannot wait. Unfortunately, many men stop visiting clinical facilities out of fear to contract coronavirus. And yet, delays in care can cause reduced quality of life and even loss of life. It is important to highlight that clinical facilities created a safe environment for prostate cancer care, including telehealth for virtual visits, ongoing in-person care, and medical procedures, including biopsy and treatment. Delays in prostate cancer are particularly unacceptable for black men who are two and a half times are more likely to die. Medical education is the second component of our program. Annual Global Summit on Precision Diagnosis and Treatment of Prostate Cancer took place virtually in October 2020. Our summit has brought together the key leaders of medicine and made a decisive impact on the state of the art and future vision for patient care. In October, we had over 400 virtual attendees. Our media partner, Grand Rounds in Urology, published summit presentations and escalated our educational impact, reaching over 15,000 prostate cancer providers internationally. Summit session one was dedicated to screening and early detection of prostate cancer. Screening with blood test PSA is extremely effective and has been shown as one of the most successful prevention strategies in the history of cancer. However, Screening tests can be abnormal not only in cancer, but also in benign diseases of the prostate, including infection and inflammation. Until only a few years ago, we did not have non-invasive diagnostic tools to sort out cancer from benign diseases. Our summit showed rapid advances in non-invasive diagnostics, including blood and urine tests for molecular markers and imaging such as MRI and ultrasound. This test can determine which individuals require invasive biopsy and which individuals do not need invasive interventions. If biopsy is needed, the current standard of care is to start with imaging that shows where lesions are located and guides biopsy needles. I think it is fair to say that blind biopsies done without accurate imaging are slowly and surely shifting to the dustbin of history. Summit session two focused on men with proven prostate cancer. We have seen rapid advances in precision diagnostics, which are critical for cancer staging and precision individualized care, including genetic testing and imaging, such as MRI and molecular imaging. Summit also highlighted emerging importance of integrated diagnostics, such as radiogenomics. Research represents the third component of our program, pilot research project of Admitech Foundation and University of Miami confirmed clinical value of radiogenomics, integrating imaging and genetics. We have shown that MRI, when integrated with genetic cancer tissue analysis, can arm physicians 
with a precise diagnostic information to determine which specific individuals have aggressive prostate cancer and need immediate life-saving treatment, and which individuals have prostate cancer that is not likely to progress or cause symptoms and need only careful observation or minimally invasive procedures. In summary, prevention and early detection are critical for saving lives and reducing disparities in both COVID-19 and prostate cancer. Advances in COVID-19 vaccines, diagnosis and treatment created light at the end of the pandemic tunnel. Advances in prostate cancer diagnostics enable precision, individualized patient care. Dr. Jason Zolz will address recent advances in treatment. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Dr. Stern. As always, you uh, you knock it out of the park. You're you're terrific on all things uh, surrounding this issue. So it is now my pleasure uh, to introduce Dr. Jason Zolz. Uh, he is our local guy here on all things prostate cancer. Uh, Dr. Zalls is the clinical director of oncology services at the Good Samaritan Medical Center. And here you go. You're up, Dr. Zalls. Good evening, and, or good afternoon, I should say. And I'd like to thank everyone for uh, an admin tech for inviting me. Uh, Dr. Cronin, thank you for the invitation. The, uh, the introduction. I appreciate it. Um, it's a pleasure to be here again. Um, so I'll try to make this somewhat brief. I know it's a beautiful day out and we'd like to all get out there and enjoy it, but I really uh, appreciate uh, being able to attend this. I'd also like to make a comment that I did uh, have received the vaccination and do um, recommend all individuals who are eligible to please go out there and get your vaccine. Um, it's, it's really important that you do. And I think as obviously leaders in our communities, you know, we need to show that we do this ourselves. Um, so just going through some updates in uh, prostate cancer care. Um, the first uh, kind of thing I've discussed in the past is basically one of the biggest things and kind of a landmark for, for, for our age with prostate cancer is discussing and looking at options and prostate cancer treatments um, and the randomized trial comparing men with low risk to intermediate risk prostate cancer, uh, comparing three different types of treatment. Uh, one being surgery, which we all know, radiation therapy, which is what I do, and also something called active surveillance, which means we actually keep an eye on the prostate cancer um, instead of having some kind of treatment. Um, the reason why we want to know what the answers are to these things is one is because not all cancers, especially prostate cancers, need to be treated. Um, we have various ways, uh, like as Dr. Stern was saying, about molecular typing, MRIs, um, as well as other common ways that we use to kind of group men into specific risk, risk categories so we can identify which men need to have treatment and which men we can actually maybe not do any treatment, which is always nice because we then don't have any side effects. Um, so this is the, uh, this, the study basically um, that was done out of Europe. Um, looking at 10 years of monitoring, either monitoring, which is active surveillance, surgery, or radiation therapy for localized prostate cancer. Um, and basically, this is a large randomized trial. You can see here, they took about 1,500 men um, and either put them into active surveillance, or they had surgery, or they had radiation therapy. Um, and what they want to do is see what the outcomes were. Um, and one of the things that I just like to show people is they sometimes you know, don't realize is that what percent of men actually die of prostate cancer at 10 years? So for men with kind of low risk or intermediate risk disease, um, just taking a guess of what percent of men do you think actually die of the cancer once they're diagnosed? Um, with either surgery or for those patients who you do active surveillance, which again, is just checking the blood test every six months or whether they do radiation therapy. So if you just look at those numbers and maybe cope with your own idea of what you think, and I'll show you in a little bit, um, and which, which option do you think has a better cure rate at 10 years? So. What the results show that if you can see here, uh, basically at 10 years, prostate cancer specific survival for men who basically were randomized to the group who did active surveillance was basically 99%, meaning a 1% chance of dying of prostate cancer at 10 years if you just did active surveillance, which means checking your blood test every six months. Surgery, 1% chance of dying of prostate cancer at 10 years. With radiation therapy, same thing, 1% chance of dying of prostate cancer at 10 years, again, for men who had low to intermediate risk disease. So that's great. We're saying, okay, it's so 1% no matter what you do. You can watch it. You can do surgery. You can do radiation. It's 1%. Well, why do any treatment then? Um, but one of the things we really worry about with prostate cancers is basically is the prostate cancer spreading to the bone. Once prostate cancer spreads to the bone, it's no longer curable. Once prostate cancer spreads to the bone, it can cause chronic pain and suffering. Some men have to be on chronic opioids. 
uh, chronic uh, anterior depression uh, deprivation therapy, which can be very toxic over time. Um, it can also break bones. I've seen broken femurs, broken hips, and broken backs. Um, so one of the things that they want to look at is clinical progression. And what they define by clinical progression is how many, what percent of men actually the prostate cancer spread to the bones or, or prostate cancer patients died. In the active surveillance, about, 20, 20, about 23 percent of men end up having the cancer spread to the bones um, and, and later died. In surgery radiation therapy, you can see it's about 9 percent. So we basically half the amount of people who progressed to have incurable prostate cancer. The big thing is to know is kind of with prostate cancer is when it does spread to the bones, your life expectancy is about three to four years. Um, there's been some ongoing follow-up. The study only had 10 years of data. There's been some ongoing follow-up. What we expected, we'll start seeing more people die in the active surveillance arm than men who got either surgery or radiation therapy. And also an important note of, the, of this trial was that in the active surveillance group, about 50% of men who were in the active surveillance arm ended up having their disease progress over time enough where they needed to be treated. So the active surveillance group in this trial, it's not that none of them got treatment, half of them did get treatment. And even so you're basically having a half of a half. Um, so this is our data that basically shows us that you do have options. Um, so when we do talk about men with prostate cancer, especially low and intermediate uh, risk disease, Life expectancy is a, certainly one of the most important conversations I have with all men, and sometimes they don't like to hear these things, uh, what their comorbidities are, um, and talk to them about exactly what we're expecting for life expectancy. And then once we have that life expectancy of our patients, we can then say, okay, here are our options and why we have these options for you. A couple of things here, I think, um, you know, certainly, uh, I think I've talked to in the past about uh, one of the more modern things that we have at the Good Samaritan Medical Center and a lot of community um, oncology centers, and even obviously in, in, in Boston, as well as the hospitals. Uh, two things I'll kind of highlight is one is called Spaceor, and that's a, that is a, 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 a brand, um, but also something called hypofractionation, which I'll get into. Um, but one of the things about with radiation therapy, just talking about uh, radiation therapy is generally a very good treatment. It's non-invasive. Um, which is always nice. One of the things we do get concerned about is the, the prostate and the rectum are in very close approximation. They actually, the rectum kind of lays right on top of the prostate. So sometimes the rectum can get irritated after radiation therapy. So we're trying to figure out ways to reduce our side effects. So one of the things we do here locally is use something called the Spaceor, which is a hydrogel. Um, this is kind of a, uh, what we call a sagittal image. It means if I cut myself right in half this way, uh, this is kind of like another, a patient that I uh, have, you can see uh, back here is his tailbone right here. This is the tailbone of the patient. Uh, the yellow is the bladder. Uh, this brown area is the rectum. Um, and this green outline here is the prostate. And this is what I'm trying to target. The, the red volume here is the radiation therapy that I'm giving. And you can see here that there's a little bit of the red is going into the rectum. So we're getting a high dose of radiation therapy into the rectum. And then we don't want to be in the rectum because that's what can potentially cause some side effects after the radiation. So what they came up with is a gel, it's a hydrogel, it's based, it's a water-based gel, and this is an MRI, and this, this is the prostate right here, this is the rectum. And what they did is they found this gel, and this gel is a water-based gel, um, and they place in this white area here is this called hydrogel. And this hydrogel gets placed in between the prostate and the rectum, creating a space. That space helps us out because then instead of the radiation therapy, um, high dose of radiation therapy going to the rectum, it gets placed into the uh, space or this hydrogel space. Therefore, it doesn't really cause, it causes less side effects. And after about six months, you can see here's the prostate uh, that was done MRI, the same prostate, had an MRI done after the radiation therapy. And this gel you can see is gone. This white stuff here, which should be here, is gone. Basically, the body just naturally reabsorbs it. Um, it's been FDA approved. They had a clinical trial. The clinical trial showed that uh, the patients who got this space or placed compared to patients who didn't have less late uh, side effects from the radiation therapy. So again, this is another MRI. This area here, this white area here is someone's bladder. This is the bladder. This is the prostate sitting here. This is the rectum sitting back here. This is the tailbone. And you can see here, this is the space where it gets placed. So now we have a space. We created a, a space that normally this rectum would be laying right next to the prostate. And I couldn't avoid giving large doses of radiation to therapy to the rectum. So kind of outlining here again, the red area here is the radiation dose that I'm giving. It's now going into the rectum here. We add the space or, oops, sorry. And this space or is a green. You can see the space or is pushing away the rectum, allowing the radiation dose, the high dose of radiation dose to stay out of the rectum, causing less side effects.
So that's one thing we do here on a regular basis. We work with our um, partners at uh, Greater uh, Boston Uro Urology who places that for us. Um, one of the things um, with radiation, something we now is being, we're using a lot more. Um, we've moved to a shorter treatments, uh, which is really nice. Um, so, because time is our most precious resource. Um, so traditionally, and, and what we have to do, we figure how do we shrink the radiation dose is we end up giving higher doses of radiation per day compared to what we did traditionally for prostate cancer. The worry is when you give a higher dose of radiation therapy per day, the higher doses could have late side effects, um, could cause some late side effects that are more seen than we call it a conventional dose. So something we have to look at is what's called the therapeutic window. In a therapeutic window, um, this is, shouldn't be that hard to understand. Basically, this is a percent to percent change, obviously, on this axis. Here is dose. Dose is what we give for radiation. Uh, the, the blue line is the tumor control, and the red is complications, basically bad side effects. So the therapeutic window or the therapeutic ratio is, is as we increase our dose of radiation therapy. So as we go up here, we, we increase our dose, our tumor control goes up higher. That's great. But what also follows that, unfortunately, is our complication rate. Our complication rate goes up the more dose of radiation therapy we give, but it's a fine balance between giving you the most radiation we can safely. So we generally try to like to work on this part of the curve, um, and that's what we call a therapeutic window. So traditionally, um, almost everywhere across the country, uh, we would call conventional radiation therapies here. Um, conventional radiation therapies, daily radiation, about 15 minutes a day for about eight and a half weeks. Um, that was considered uh, largely the standard of care during my training and even up to about three or four years ago. Um, over the last couple of years, what we're, we're moving to, instead of eight and a half weeks of radiation, we're using what's called moderate hypofractionation, which has now become largely the preferred method of treatment. And what we're able to do is instead of having 44 treatments of radiation therapy on average, right now we're able to back that down to about 28 treatments for our patients, which is really nice. We're saving about three weeks of treatment for the patients um, with the same cure rates, and generally the same uh, side effect profile uh, that we had with the longer course of radiation. Um, so that's something that we have uh, been doing and offering to our patients at uh, Good Samaritan for about the last two years now. Uh, we've moved to a shorter course of treatment, same cure rates uh, with the same basic side effect profiles for our patients, which is great news. Um, one of the last things I'll briefly discuss is basically uh, some of the new diagnostic imaging. There's actually a lot of things coming out on this. Um, and basically, I, for the most part is basically recurrence after surgery or radiation therapy. Uh, usually we treat patients, myself or the urologist have close follow-ups with the patients, checking blood tests for their PSAs every six months uh, to detect if it ever comes back. Um, so therefore, most of the time, as long as the patient's being followed by a, a, a cancer, prostate cancer expert, either the urologist or myself, a radiation oncologist, they were able to assess whether or not the prostate cancers come back. Um, the detections early is great, but what happens is when you detect the cancer so early, you detect it at such a minute level in the body, it's really hard to find. So then what happens is traditional um, workups for prostate cancer recurrence is like a bone scan. Um, again, prostate cancer generally likes to go to the bones. So when we have a recurrence, we always check the bones. We do a bone scan. But for men with generally relatively low PSAs at the time of uh, the recurrence, the bone scans aren't very helpful. Same thing with CAT scans. CAT scans, we order them. But to be honest, we, we generally know that we're not going to generally find anything on the CAT scan and the bone scan, but they are considered our, our standard packet to follow up for patients who have recurrences after prostate cancer, whether it be surgery or radiation therapy. Um, so a lot of times we do these tests, we don't know where it's coming back, and we have to make treatment decisions on incomplete information, which I'm sure as all, everyone can attest is not the best idea, but that's what we had to go off. One of the newer, uh, basically, this is a newer scanning type. It's basically a PET CT for the um, a PET scan uh, for prostate cancer. It's a uh, fluciclovine, um, and basically, this is a dye that's specifically used, and it's basically got a prostate cancer uh, tag to it, where it's a radioactive tag, and it, it specifically attaches to prostate cells. Um, so it doesn't really attach to any other cell. So usually, PET scans, uh, normal PET scans, we do not do for prostate cancer because it just it just doesn't bind very well. Uh, but this is a, a little protein, little dye that they give um, that is able to dye, um, to attach to prostate cancer cells specifically. So this has allowed us to, to change how we follow up and for patients who have recurrences after prostate cancer, we're able to now even identify um, early um, prostate cancer recurrences and find out where they are. For this particular patient, they had surgery, 
And then uh, year, about five years later, this little area here that's lighting up, you can see this little dot. This is a lymph node. Um, generally, if you looked at the CAT scan of this lymph node, you wouldn't think anything of it. You'd be like, normal size, don't worry about it. It's not that. Um, but this actually showed us specifically where the cancer was, specific lymph node it was. We treated it, um, and a gentleman's PSA went to about 2.3 after surgery. We gave him radiation therapy. We treated this lymph node along with some other lymph nodes that were considered to be at risk, and his PSA basically dropped to undetectable. So we're able to now target areas that we weren't able to target before because now we can find them because now we have better imaging. Now, this 18 um, fluciclabine is a nice new dye. There's also PMSA dyes. Um, there's some other um, imaging modalities that are coming out that are starting to be approved. And the other thing is what's great about it is now is we're starting to get, actually have clinical trials where instead of using these PET CTs or these, um, these fluciclabine scans after people recur, we're actually starting to move maybe up for high risk patients who may have lymph node metastases early on. We're starting to look at clinical trials um, and, and using these scanning ahead of time. Um, so maybe spotting cancers at different areas that we can target a little better. And hopefully, um, you guys all don't feel like this after my talk. Um, it's after a it's after a ski trip, so <laughs> they're pretty knackered. But thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Doctor, so much. Uh, so now, Representative Cassidy and I are here to moderate any questions any of you might have. A doctor, a question for Doctor Zales. Yes. Um, Dr. Zoll, after the body absorbs that, that, that space gel, uh, uh, can, uh, can, there, can there be additional gel added over time, or is it, or is it a radiation problem? So, so the, the gel is used for radiation therapy patients only. It's not used for surgical patients. Uh, it's just used for radiation therapy. Um, you can... So generally we treat the prostate cancer with radiation. We generally don't like to give more radiation. Um, having said that, um, there are people who are doing it. I have a colleague um, in town, Dr. Martin King at Dana-Farber who does do re-irradiation using specialized uh, radiation therapy with, with catheters and an MRI that goes into the prostate. I'm not sure if he's reinserting the space or at that time he may be. It's a very good question. I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Thank you. It may be difficult to do. Um... I would like to, can I be heard? Okay, great. Um, I would like to emphasize a couple of points in Dr. Zoll's presentation, if I may. Uh, uh, first of all, Dr. Zoll's pointed out that there are new molecular imaging technologies right now available to diagnose uh, metastatic spread very, very early. And what I want to emphasize and agree with Dr. Zoll's that at this uh, stage, of early, uh, early recurrence, what we call, or uh, cancer coming back or cancer spread, uh, there is a very good probability of our ability to treat this disease successfully. So this early diagnosis of metastatic spread has become very important in, in, um, in the face of emerging treatment so that we can actually, uh, it, it actually became a treatable disease. Um, Dr. Zos, do you want to comment on, because usually uh, we, talk, we talk about curable disease when it is confined only to the prostate. Right now, we actually expanded our definition to treatable disease to early stages of um, spread, oligometastatic disease, if you will, and the role of, of course, molecular imaging define um, if it is either a small local spread that is treatable vis-a-vis -vis metastatic spread that is no longer treatable. Do you want to elaborate a little bit more about new stage of treatability, if you will, of prostate cancer? Uh, sure. So, you know, one of the, one of the issues with uh, men who have recurrences of prostate cancer, they're generally put on long-term androgen deprivation therapy, which is basically blocking testosterone production in the body. Um, it works well, it's been shown to work well, but one of the issues with it has a, lo a lot of long-term side effects to men, decreased libido, uh, you can get a big belly, you get muscle wasting, you get bone mineral density loss. So these drugs in the short term are okay, but over the long term um, have a lot of uh, side effects. One of the, in, in cancer care, we're, we're starting to move to models instead of just looking at incurable cancer um, differently. 
Whereas traditionally we looked at incurable cancers anytime it went outside the organ usually that we're looking at that we're focusing on, let's say for the prostate. But we're learning that not all quote unquote metastatic disease is the same. Some people have metastatic disease at their time of recurrence and the cancer is everywhere, let's say in their bones for prostate cancer. It's, you know, in the cervical spine, the hips, the arms, the ribs, et cetera. But some people also have recurrences of prostate cancer or even other kinds of cancers where it just might be limited, at least that we can see, just limited to a smaller focal area, maybe just in one backbone or one area of the femur. So that's called oligo, oligo meaning low number. Um, so oligo metastatic means low number of uh, metastatic sites. And we generally define that as less than five sites. With oligo metastatic disease, again, it's not just limited to prostate cancer. We do use it for lung cancer oftentimes as well. Um, what we're looking at is new models saying which patients are quote unquote incurable now because the cancer has spread beyond where we would think it to be curable, which patients have limited sites of disease where maybe we can either do surgery on or ablative therapies like radiation therapy on or sometimes cryotherapy on. Can we treat those sites um, individually instead of just saying, okay, we can't do anything. We're just going to give you drugs and medications, et cetera. Can we treat those sites individually, get rid of some of the, 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 the gross, when I say, what I mean by gross is the visualized disease that we can see and will patients live longer? Um, there has been some early studies to suggest that with either um, you start treating these sites of disease with radiation or surgery, um, that patients, they have a good, like for prostate cancer, have a good PSA response, and we're able to delay maybe some, some other medications, um, and they could also translate into living longer or living more of a disease control state where instead of saying, okay, you know, we only have three or four years life expectancy, well, maybe we still have incurable prostate cancer, but we're able to slow the progression of disease so much further down where they may have more um, years ahead than the traditional three or four that we expect, um, more years ahead where they're not in pain um, and they're having a better quality of life. So we do have uh, oligometastatic disease, as Dr. Stern was saying, it is something uh, it's a big focus now in the last three or four years in oncology. Um, and, and it is something that we certainly look at um, when talking with the patient, what the patient's preferences are, when we can be aggressive. And I'd like to emphasize the take home point from what Dr. Zoll just said. And that is the earlier the treatment, the less invasive it is, the fewer complications there are, um, the less expensive it is as well. Uh, so the uh, again, it emphasizes the critical importance of uh, regular visits to your doctor, screening, and early detection. Although we are pleased to have much more advanced uh, treatment tools for what even a few years ago we felt was an incurable disease. Thanks, Dr. Stern. Uh, do we have any other questions before we sign off? We have no other questions from uh, no other audience. questions. Uh, so I'd just like to close by saying thank you, Chief Gomes, uh, Chief Williams, and Chris Devona for all you have done uh, over the last year. Uh, thank you, Mayor Sullivan, uh, for all that you have done, Dr. Stern, uh, and in addition, you know, the Brockton area and AACP. This has been a, a quest for the Brockton area and AACP and the work that they have done over the last uh, several years has significantly made a difference in our community. Uh, so I thank you all for that uh, and wish you all uh, a nice rest of the day. And I'm gonna turn it over to Jerry Cassidy for one final goodbye. Uh, Majority Leader, I'm just gonna follow you and it's a beautiful day out. I wanna thank everybody else on this panel and in the uh, Brockton NAACP, thank you very much for every everything you do. Uh, Phyllis and Steve and everybody there, th thank you very much and uh, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank everybody. you very much. Thank, thank you. you.